So greetings from these beautiful Coast Salish homelands at the Bank Center for Educational Justice here in the College of Education at the University of Washington. It's just a wonderful opportunity uh, to be with you all today. These are Duwamish lands and Suquamish lands, Snoqualmie lands, the lands of the tribes of Muckleshoot and Tulalip, Puyallup lands and the shared homelands of other Coast Salish peoples. And I'm so grateful to live and work as a guest on these lands. Acknowledging the lands and the people of the lands in this way is just a small act in the ongoing process of working to be in good relationship with the land and the people of the land, and ultimately toward decolonization, the return of land, land back. I also want to honor that today is Dia de los Muertos, and so sending much love to, and light to all remembering and celebrating those uh, relatives who have uh, journeyed on to all holding our ancestors extra tight today and tomorrow. So this is a really special evening uh, celebrating Gloria Latson Billings' new book, Culturally Relevant Pedagogy, Asking a Different Question. Well, we hold up her three decades of work on CRP and set ourselves for the decades of culturally relevant pedagogy to come. This is the second book in the Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy series. And I wanna make sure that um, everybody joining us today uh, checks out the beautiful first book in the series, Protecting the Promise, Indigenous Education Between Mothers and Their Children. Here it is right here by Timothy San Pedro in partnership with five brilliant native mothers and their families. It's an absolutely gorgeous book. So hopefully you have a chance to check it out. I want to uh, briefly thank a few people who made this event possible before we get started um, knowing Gloria Latson Billings and myself, once she gets sharing her brilliance and then we get in conversation, the time is gonna fly. So I wanna make sure to uh, thank some folks who have made this possible. So many thanks to center research assistants and doc students and uh, extraordinary educators and leaders, Jasmine Moore, Elena Eagleshield and Dua Ka, thank you so much. I wanna thank our entire team here at the University of Washington College of Ed, including Charlene Wilcox, Kendra Lomax, Deborah Masachi, Ryan Stewart, Kent Jewell, Laura Beth Strait, and many others. Also wanted to thank our live captioners for this event, uh, Carol Hood and Farrell Kopecki. Thanks so much for your necessary work. Also wanted to thank uh, Emily Spangler, who's our uh, editor at Teachers College Press and everybody at Teachers College Press for their partnership in the CSP series. Really appreciate your partnership in this work. To my main collaborator on the CSP work, H. Sammy Aleem and everyone in the CSP Collective, much love and thanks always. And finally, our deepest gratitude to James and Cherry Banks, whose ongoing work and legacy we hold up across all of our work here in the Bank Center. So it's now my profound honor to introduce Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. Dr. Gloria Latson Billings is Professor Emerita at UW-Madison, President of the National Academy of Education. I should mention a University of Washington alum as we were just chatting about a moment ago. And I guess since uh, Issa Rae is out here trying to make it cool to be a black alum at Stanford, I should also mention a fellow black Stanford alum. As I write in my series editor, editor's intro to this uh, amazing book, Culturally Relevant Pedagogy Asking a Different Question, I wrote, this is the culturally relevant pedagogy greatest hits volume we have always needed. Very few people in the world, musicians, artists, organizers, scholars, warrant such a collection. Gloria Latson Billings is among those rare generational geniuses who has offered us so much that collecting her decades long brilliance in one volume is both fitting and necessary. Indeed. Later in the foreword I write, as Latson Billings has written in her own generous and generative engagement with H. Sammy Aleem, myself, and the broader CSP collective, quote, culturally sustaining pedagogy uses culturally relevant pedagogy as the place where the beat drops, end quote. It's that leading beat, that break toward justice, that heartbeat of culturally relevant pedagogy that leads us and hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of educators in the work we do. But what I really want to say in introducing Dr. Gloria Latson Billings is that Gloria is one of the rare people that can be hero, mentor, and friend all at once. And I am so grateful to be able to call her all of these. I'm not the only one who wanted to offer some praise. Uh, we wanted to hear from a few other friends as well.
Hello, Big Mama, love you. I'm so excited about this new project. Um, you mean the world to me. Your work changed my life, uh, both personally and professionally. I gained the vocabulary to talk about pedagogies that are meaningful um, for our children. And I'm forever grateful for having known you and the opportunity to, to study and learn from you. Love you, bye. Hi, Gloria. It's impossible to imagine the field of education without you and your work. That's because you made it impossible not to ask a different question. And the answers and your model gave us the courage to act. One person, one classroom, one cultural world at a time. With so much love, honor, and respect, Gloria. Thank you. Dear Gloria, Congratulations on the launching of your newest book. Since we first met many years ago when I attended your presentation of Like Lightning in a Bottle, we've been friends and colleagues. And indeed, your work reflects your brilliance and your continuing relevance. I am proud to call you, call you friends, and I wanted to say congratulations and continued success. See you soon. Hi, Gloria. This is Carol. Just wanting to wish you the best on the launch of this new book. It is a testimony to the movement that you certainly have started in education that has been built on by succeeding scholars. You are an absolute star and a gem and a wonderful sister. Love you deeply and wishing you the very best. Take care. And with those beautiful words, I'll hand it over to Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. Gloria. Thank you. You're not supposed to make me cry before the, the launch. We did have some discussion about <laughs> whether we should be doing that at the end or before. Um, so that's my bad. <laughs> well, I'm thankful and grateful. And you know, you you were um, kind and generous enough to acknowledge where you are. And because of COVID, I get to acknowledge where I am. So I am here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which occupies the ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place that their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. And in 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. And decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. But today the UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. So as you said, it doesn't, none of that changes the history, but it certainly acknowledges where we are and we are grateful for the opportunity to share these lands. I wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening in the uh, East and the Midwest, uh, probably late afternoon on the West Coast. I wanna especially thank Django and his team, wonderful young scholars. I wanna thank the Bank Center for Educational Justice and Jim and Cherry who are dear friends in particular. And of course, I wanna thank all of those hardworking editors uh, and folks at TC Press who have made this particular volume um, possible. I'm gonna share my screen, not because I'm that enamored of slides, but I'm one of these people that if the slides provide a kind of a set of guardrails for me. So I don't run off the road here and, and go talking. And, you know, if I start talking to Django, I'll start talking about food and won't have anything to do with the book. So I wanna make sure that um, I use this time wisely. So uh, bear with me as I indeed share the screen. And let's see, and you should be able to see that great. Um, and I've titled the collection, Asking a Different Question, Culturally Relevant Pedagogy. Um, 
But I want to acknowledge my cover artist. Uh, this is Jerry Jordan, who did the art for this book. And here are a couple other uh, aspects and uh, examples of uh, Jerry's work. Jerry actually works in the School of Education in Wisconsin. He is a, a student advisor. Um, so the, the our young soon to be teachers seek him out for help and how to navigate our credential programs. But he is a magnificent artist and he's had a couple um, shows on campus, exhibits on campus. Uh, he's done some magnificent covers for our um, local uh, black magazine, Umoja. And if you ever come to Madison and go to our technical college, which is an equivalent of community college in the West Coast, you will see beautiful mural that he has painted to depict some local heroes. I don't know how I ended up on that wall, but I want to thank him. And so I'm really happy that uh, I was able to use his cover. Um, Django did a great job of telling you who I am. Indeed, I am Professor Emerita at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is a fancy way of saying that I am retired. Although I will tell you that I am flunking at retirement. I'm, I'm the worst retiree ever. Uh, I am the current president of the National Academy of Education for, if I count it right, maybe about nine more days. I am a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, a fellow of the Hagler Institute of Texas A&M University in its 2021-20, excuse me, 2020-2021 cohort. I'm a fellow of the British Academy. I'm a distinguished visiting scholar at the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers. So you can see that I don't have time to have a full-time job because I have all these other things that I have committed to doing. But most important on that list is that I am a teacher with 52 years of experience. And it's why I've been so committed to really researching and trying to understand teaching. I also think that in addition to being able to say who I am, it's important to talk about where I'm from. And so you see four pictures here. Top left-hand picture is my hometown. The skyline of Philadelphia is represented there. I was born there. I'm just like Will Smith in West Philadelphia, born and raised on the play van. No, okay, shouldn't go that. But I actually am a West Philadelphian. Uh, and uh, Philadelphia helped to form me as a young person to shape my worldview and perspectives. The picture right beneath there is a picture that was taken on the campus of Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. That statue was a statue of Frederick Douglass. And so each and every day for almost four years, I walked by Fred or I met people at Fred or did you see so-and-so today? Yeah, they were by Fred early this morning. In other words, he was a fixture in my daily life. And shocking to me to be teaching uh, young people here at the University of Wisconsin who've never heard of Frederick Douglass. Uh, but Baltimore grew me up. So Philadelphia bred me, raised me, but Baltimore grew me up. The picture in the top right-hand side, if you are tuning in from the University of Washington, you know that picture. I, I lovingly say this is a picture that you can get maybe five days out of a year that is the mountain and the fountain. You guys know it from the view from Red Square where you look at that fountain and off into the beautiful horizon you see Mount Rainier. Uh, I came to the University of Washington in 1970. Uh, I met the young assistant professor named James A. Banks. So that's how far we go back. As we like to say in West Philly, we go back like Cadillac seats way back. And so Wisconsin, um, Washington was uh, also formative in shaping how I would view the world and certainly scholarship. Then the final picture is uh, a picture looking west on Palm Drive towards Memorial Church on the campus of Stanford University. Uh, Stanford was one of the uh, most 
interesting experiences that I had. Certainly five years as a graduate student there, uh, another six uh, teaching in the Bay Area at Santa Clara University. I had taught three years in uh, the Ravenswood City School District. So I had an interesting time in Palo Alto. My sons regard themselves as Californians having grown up there. So these four places really speak to where I'm from and, and who I am. The notion, however, if you, if you know my work, you know I wrote a book entitled The Dream Keepers because the dreams are a powerful metaphor for understanding the sojourn of African-Americans. And I was taken by this quote from Harriet Tubman that she said, in my dreams and visions, I seem to see a line and on the other side of that line were green fields and lovely flowers and beautiful white ladies who stretched out their arms to me over the line, but I couldn't reach them no how. I always fell before I got to the line. So when I share it with you where I grew up, both Philadelphia and then in Baltimore, that was one side of the line. For me to reach over to the University of Washington in Seattle and then on to Palo Alto at Stanford, it was like, always felt like falling before you got to the line. But of course, um, the heritage of African-Americans has is peppered with dreamers. And another really well-known dreamer, of course, is that of Martin Luther King. And what has always frustrated me about the constant invoking of this particular speech is that it's always truncated. Uh, the speech didn't have to be called, I have a dream. That became the riff, the sermonic riff that he went, fell into at the March on Washington. But the dream was about a promissory note that showing up in Washington and refusing to believe that the Bank of Justice would send back that promissory note mark insufficient funds. Those powerful images and, and metaphors are never invoked. It is just this sort of a theor theor oh, excuse me, ethereal no notion of a dream. And then one other quote dreamer that I want to invoke is kind of, you know, everybody, you talk about having a spirit um, guide. For me, it's September Clark, who said, I believe unconditionally in the ability of people to respond where they are, when they are told the truth. We need to be taught to study rather than believe and to inquire rather than to affirm. And so September Clark was someone who really pushed dreams into reality. Well, let me just back up a little bit and talk about my early um, travels into this whole field. You know, I started out trying to figure out what should I be? You know, I actually, thought I was going to be a chemist. I was good at chemistry. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, it. In some ways, it, it was one of the easiest sciences for me to pursue. Um, but I didn't have a passion for chemistry. Um, I didn't question things about chemistry. I followed the rules. Uh, it wasn't until I would sit down and begin to write and ask questions about uh, the nature of the world and the inequalities that kept showing up, that I realized that I indeed could think on paper. So while I wish I had a lovely story to tell you about always wanting to be a teacher and lining up dolls and you know teaching little kid, not so. I was well into my career as an undergraduate uh, before I made that choice. And I really made it because I had some friends who said, well, hey, you're, you're majoring in history, which is what I love. Um, you're minoring in English. You should be a teacher. So I'm one of these people who fell into teaching. This picture is from my first year as a teacher of middle school students. And every time I look at it, I, I think, who would give this child a job. She clearly doesn't know what she's doing. Uh, 
And so I often will tell my teacher candidates, it wasn't about me always loving teaching or believing I was born to teach. I didn't learn to love teaching until I started teaching. It was the students who helped me learn to love the practice. I'm someone who has done what I think of as coast to coast teaching. On the left picture, you see the, uh, a map of uh, Philadelphia. Those uh, red zip codes here are West Philadelphia. Uh, I began teaching down in the green zip codes of South Philadelphia. And from Philadelphia, to the San Francisco Bay Area. If you look at that map, you see a kind of mauve or pinkish uh, section on the, of the counties in the Bay Area. The peninsula, as they call it in the Bay Area, is where I began my teaching in East Palo Alto. So I've gone from one coast to the other. I had a very interesting experience at Stanford because I went to Stanford in the mid 1970s there was not one black professor in the School of Education at that time. There was no one interested, at least from their research interests, in the education of black children. And the only thing that allowed me to just not give up was I found my way to the Department of Anthropology and then to the program in Afro on uh, Afro-American studies uh, and a woman by the name of Sylvia Winter. It allowed me to sort of make sense of what it was I was trying to study because nothing in the School of Education was speaking to me. Uh, nothing was real passion. I could not imagine my entire life being like what I was seeing in that school. From Stanford, uh, I, became, I was place bound because I had children and I promised my sons that we would not move during their high school years. So we stayed and I just couldn't take a job other than something in the Bay Area. So the job I took was at Santa Clara University, which was about 12 miles south of where we lived in Palo Alto. Now I was complaining about Stanford but then I got to Santa Clara and here at Santa Clara, I was one of five black professors in the university, not in, in education, in the university. Uh, I can call them by name. One of the reasons why Joyce King and I remained such good friends is because we experienced Santa Clara together. Here I was at this private Catholic Jesuit institution with only four other black colleagues and 250, 250 black students on a campus of over 20,000 students. So it was a place that I knew uh, was not going to, couldn't be my, my uh, last place. Uh, I just didn't know when I was going to be able to, to make um, a decision to leave Santa Clara, but I knew that Santa Clara wasn't going to be the place that my career could flourish. Um, so what actually happened for me that made change, turned everything around was the ability to be awarded a Spencer National Academy of Education postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, it got me outside of that Silicon Valley bubble. Um, I was giving talks at places all over the country. And one of the places that I gave a talk was at the University of Wisconsin. And they were really receptive to the work that I was trying to do. The, that uh, Spencer postdoc, and I'd like to remind my students that the postdoc is really where the dream keepers came from, not out of my dissertation. I literally dropped the work I was doing in my dissertation and started a new line of work that resulted in the Spencer and ultimately the dream keepers and this whole line of work around culturally relevant pedagogy. When I did the Spencer, I really had two hunches. The first one was that black students can experience academic, social, cultural, and civic success 
with skillful teachers. You see, the question kept being, what's wrong with these kids? And I really felt like, you know, they actually can be successful. I, I was an N of one at this point uh, who had experienced this success. Actually, in truth, an N of two because my brother had been successful. We both grew up in West Philadelphia. We had working class parents. We had no money or resources. We had no intergenerational wealth. I went to Stanford. He got an MBA from the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania. But we had had some skillful teachers. I also had a second hunch was that African-American teachers could be key to Black student success. And I think that's interesting because I had these hunches back in the late 1980s. And there's been recently a study that shows that Black students having one to two Black teachers, I think there's a 39% increase for Black boys and their likelihood of completing uh, 12th grade if they have uh, a black teacher. There was the whole issue of the dwindling black teachers and these are statistics from the National Center for Educational Statistics. And you see on the left-hand side that the student population is becoming increasingly um, non-white while the teaching population is still a very white space. More than 70% of our teachers are white. So that was one of my concerns. If black teachers might be one of my hunches as the key, but yet they were dwindling, what's gonna happen? So I began to flip the question and I changed the question from what's wrong with black children and their parents and their families and their communities to one that says, well, what is right with them and their parents and their families and their communities? Because the literature characterized Black children as culturally deprived, as at risk, when Margaret Beale Spencer has been clear to tell us to be human is to be at risk. I mean, we all, you know, you're, if you're looking at what's happening in um, Glasgow, Scotland right now, the whole planet is at risk, not just one little group of kids. And it also characterized Black children as coming from a culture of poverty. In the latest language, they say our children lack grit. And I have said in several spaces, no, our kids have grit. It just has an S on it. We've always had grits. I know I'm being tongue in cheek here, but what I'm suggesting to you is that this whole notion of resilience, what other group of children would be so beaten down, so denigrated, so despised, but still show up for school every day? What other group of children would be so left out of the mainstream, lack of access to health resources, uh, all kinds of uh, social benefits being denied to them, but they still show up for school. Nobody has more grit than black children. So I wanna share with you a little video that you may have seen about a little boy. Um, and I picked this up during this whole COVID time and I absolutely love this kid, so hold on. has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How how much money how much money does he have? Jay broke. <laughs> and he's right. Jaden is broke. He doesn't have enough money. It's the ingenuity of the children. Now this kid's saying this at home, which is why I'm sure his parents uh videoed it and posted it. But he could make that same statement in school and be kicked out of class or be detained or suspended or privileges taken away because he has identified the obvious. Jaden is broke. That's the, the way in which I've tried to reshape the way we think about these young people. Uh, 
I want to share with you a video from one of my former students here at Wisconsin, who I think does the same thing in a spoken word form by the name of Jonathan Williams. We have our last and final Raise Up Champion, Raise Up Winner and Champion. Uh, his name is Jonathan Williams. He's out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I want y'all to give it up for Jonathan Williams, y'all. Jonathan Williams, absent. See, I always had the mental capacity and the master key to overcome any academic tragedy, but I had to see and learn from my faults. Because my rotten GPA were where my lessons were taught. I was a 3.6 high achiever up in middle school. No guidance resided in my silence and swimming pools didn't appreciate the doggy paddle that I had mastered when Jonathan Williams was absent. Alexander Hamilton High, Milwaukee Public Schools Finest. I learned the art of skipping classes and wrote Bueller on my eyelids. The tension room sidekick with some fly kicks and a tight click, balled up homework in the same fisty students fight with. Jonathan Williams, absent. It was tragic. Amidst good times and laughing, my GPA was dragging against a system not meant for me, mentally in misery. My freshman year stats, 102 days absent. All Fs, 0, 0.0 GPA, cumulative. Swimming pool, doggy paddle. Drowning, I started a movement for improvement, but couldn't dry off with the white towels my teachers threw in. I tried to show my mind could grow like every other student, but people pass on your perspective when your presence also truant. More than a reflection of a freshman year screw up with a blueprint of a ladder, but no tools for me to move up. No electricity, mom and pops missing, so have them drop out. That's just family tradition. Jonathan Williams, absent. I found a flashlight by the name of Uncle Jeff. Moved in. The floor and three pillows were enough for me to stay focused, make sure this hopeless ship stays floating. By my senior year, I was actually a senior. <laughs> hey, you know, dressed a little cleaner, professional demeanor. It seems to be I'm on track like Jackie Joyner with six medals, fighting my academic debt and my fist medal. But the worst thing you can see when you made it and educated are the people who gave up and them obstacles you evaded. Because, I mean, we, we quicker to give up than you do. I mean, we just like YouTube, we just broadcast ourselves and hope that you like it. Maybe care to comment, cause I didn't need to be hooked on phonics, I just needed the people around me to be critical and honest, cause we don't know yet that resources and allocated money is the hood's morphine. The only scholarships I knew of was professional sports teams. Now I'm here. I'm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. scholar and resident, full tuition scholarship and Kappa Alpha Psi president. So I'm saying we, we can be useless, clueless, ruthless, just a nuisance, worthless, workless, just, just the worst urban person, but we got to reconstruct our approach to avoid these different labels and synonyms and help the youth overcome this system that's not meant for them. Thank you. Now, what you should know is that Jonathan, the original version of um, that spoken word piece is what he submitted to me for a final project. And of course, I thought it was absolutely fabulous. And there are parts in, of, of our entire course that are woven through this. Um, Jonathan not only graduated from the University of Wisconsin, that piece of uh, what, what you saw was his performance at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, in which he won that raise up uh, competition 
uh, designed to keep kids from dropping out of school. He eventually went to the University of Florida and earned a Master's of Fine Arts. And he's currently a working um, actor in Los Angeles. But it's this notion that the kids are so much more, I mean, who could have more grit than this young man? He told you his freshman year, he missed 102 days, that he failed everything. But somehow just finding that, that one person, his uncle Jeff, and being able to just keep going day after day, that's resilience, that's grit. So the big part of the work, and I wanna wrap here because I really do wanna be able to um, talk with Django and also answer your questions. The big part of this work is about learning to see the children not as a stereotype. You guys remember this ad, the coolest monkey in the jungle, right? HMS, I guess, did these uh, sweatshirts. But to begin to see our young people as the prototype, to be the scholar, the student, the young person that everybody should want to be. So I thank you all for uh, joining me here today. I hope you will uh, buy the book, of course, but I hope that you will continue to pursue this work because the work should not end with me. Thank you so much, Gloria. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and um, as always, uh, a master class um, in the work um, that is uh, brilliant, um, and invites us in at the same time. And, uh, and so really appreciate that. So uh, folks can you know, ask, ask some questions in the chat and we'll see if we have some time for, for you know, a couple of those. Um, and it's, it's hard to, to know where to start. I mean, one thing I wanted to say uh, just to start is, you know, there's no reason, um, you, know, you would remember this of course, but you know, back in uh, whatever it was, the earlier 2000s, I think you were, um, you were a scholar at the, advanced, the Center for Advanced Study. And you came into um, my graduate class at Stanford, the class on teaching. And you, uh, you shared for, um, for some time with us uh, this different question. And I know for many of us in that room, but I can speak for myself, that set me off on, um, invited me uh, to join this work. And, uh, and I know that so many can say that. I'm so grateful for that moment. Um, and, and thinking about, um, you know, the, the many uh, struggles that many of us, many Black folks, many, many, many folks of color, Indigenous folks, um, had on that campus, um, even to this day, uh, but also what it meant to be invited into this work by you in that space. So, um, so thank you. Uh, You're yeah, there's a couple of things I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, one is um, you, in the, in the postscript in, uh, to, the, to the book, and I've had the, the, um, the privilege of over the last, um, I mean, nobody got their book yet because of the mail short, the mail slowdown, but there's thousands that have been ordered, but I do have a PDF. So I've been able to read through the book in the last, um, in the last bit. And, uh, and one of the real gifts is to read that 1995 piece again. Um, mm. uh, and I, you know, I read it when, you know, we were working on, on, on curating the book earlier again, but I, I read it, you know, recently. And, and, and so one of the things I'm thinking about um, in the postscript to the book, you write, I, I never imagined the study of successful teachers of African-American students would send me across the country and around the world. And so um, I'm thinking about, you know, when you wrote Dream Keepers and that seminal 1995 piece, and I'm so excited that uh, a new generation and all of the, those of us who have been reading your work for years get to revisit this work and re-engage it. Um, but, you know, so when you think back to the Dream Keepers, that 1995 piece, you know, all centered on the work of excellent teachers of Black children, I'm wondering if you knew in some way um, that you were offering something um, that would be taken up so deeply, or, you know, if you had some sense of that, and then also connected to that, uh, what has sort of surprised you or what surprised you along the way in terms of the many communities, the many settings, the many places that the work has been taken up in? 
So I have to be honest, no, I did not think that it would take off like this. Um, and in fact, I, I didn't set out to even write a book. I just wanted to do the study. And I figured the study would, you know, I could write some articles and publish. Right. Uh, and it was actually an editor um, from the then Josie Bass uh, imprint, which is now under John Wiley uh, and company, a woman by the name of Leslie Iura uh, called me because, you know, the um, with the Spencer, they list, the Chronicle of Higher Ed lists who the winners are, uh, what their project is, and where they are. And apparently she happened to see it and she called and asked if uh, she could take me to lunch. And you know, assistant professor, you're not going to turn down a free lunch, you know. Yeah, right. So, book or so, no book, I get a free. Right. <laughs> so we went to lunch, and over lunch, she said, "Well, have you ever thought of uh, like, you know, because she wanted to hear about the project, and I told yeah. her what I was imagining." And she said, "Well, have you ever thought of doing that as a book?" And I said, "No, <laughs> I have not." And she said, right. "Well, I wish you would." And I thought about it and thought about it. And I thought, well, maybe this could be a book. So I didn't even know I was going to write a book. I right. thought I was going to write some methodological pieces. I did write one in QSE. And I thought I was going to write a piece about um, these teachers, right? That's right. Um, so I don't think there's a way. But I've been talking to young people here in Madison, I, I just talked to the combined Black Student Union across the city. So, you know, I don't know, about 400 some high school students. Mm, nice. And one of the things that I said to them is I said, you know what, you guys got, whenever you see me, if you see me in the, in the supermarket, if you see me uh, in the community, see me at the Urban League or at the One City Schools where I hang out, I'm on that board. If you see me, I said, I want you to tell me three things. I said, if you don't remember anything else from today, three things purpose, passion, and planning. Mm -hmm. And I gave them the example of Jay-Z and Beyonce. I said, what's their purpose? And they're like, yeah, they want to make all this good music. I said, no, no, that's their passion. I said, the purpose is intergenerational wealth. They want to make enough money that they don't have to worry about their kids. And I said, not only have they now done that, Definitely. But now they're giving money away, right? So they're creating, you know, and, and you know, I don't think that Jay's plan was all that great from the beginning, you no. know? No. It got better. I watched his speech last, uh, from the, for the Hall of Fame, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. But Beyonce had a plan. This is how this thing is going to work. Uh, and so it I said- It was me, myself, and I, and then, and then Jay came into the mix, and then she's like, okay, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that I realized that this work was my passion. I, I didn't have the purpose fully um, articulated, but the passion was to ensure that uh, mm -hmm. Black children got the best education they could possibly get. Um, and so I think you, you can't always know uh, my planning probably wasn't that great. Our, our, last week, I spoke to the students of the Black Doctoral Network, and I, um, I think this, the title slide says something like, who's managing your doctoral career? And I said, it's a trick question, because mm -hmm. if the answer is not you, then nobody is, <laughs> right? Nobody is. And so again, I, I took them back to the purpose, the passion, and the planning. What is it that you that keeps you up at night? What is it that thing you would do even if they didn't pay you to do it? Um, and yes. what's the purpose of doing it? And what's your plan for getting it done? So it, it, it hindsight is 2020. I wish I could say that I knew all of that before then. Uh, I will tell you that having now taking this work and having this work take me around the world. Right. When I realized that I have colleagues in Sweden right. who are working with Somali kids saying, we needed, we, we so need this book. This helps us. When I have colleagues in Australia who are working right. with indigenous students, right. um, 
colleagues in, I did, did a talk for folks at St. Francis Xavier, I believe, uh, college in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely amazing and it's, uh, and it's beautiful and it's right. And I think, again, that different question for so many of us, it shifted, it, it, it shifted us and it continues to shift us toward the strength and, and wisdom of our communities. Um, and, and I think in, in ever deeper ways, um, I know that I'm, I, I just I have to ask you at, at least one more question because I of course have many things um, that I that I'd love to to share um, in this space with you and with everyone who's joining us. Um, you know, there's that quote since we're talking about Dreamkeepers. There's, there's that quote in Dreamkeepers where you say the teachers I studied worked in opposition to the system that employs them. And then I was reading the postscript to to the book. You know, when you're talking about um, when you're talking about post-pandemic pandemic pedagogy, when you're talking about um, youth centering youth culture, um, when you're talking about climate crisis, as you you know you were talking about, um, and so uh, I guess maybe just as a last, and, you know, and here we are, you know, CRT being you know continually attacked and banned, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a new chapter of an old story. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm wondering what that looks like for you now. You also write about the ways that that third tenet of, CS, of, of, of CRP, that third tenet of cultural level pedagogy being socio-political uh, critique and so, you know, um, uh, uh, social consciousness, that that's the one that's often left out. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if um, what, what you see as teachers working in opposition to the system looking like now or, or what, you, what you see, um, you know, socio-political work looking like now, what seems important to you for, for educators and for us all as educators? So I think the, the part of the critical consciousness or the socio-political consciousness that people are, may get wrong, which gets lost in translation, right. is that it is not about the teacher's agenda. Right. And I think people think, well, I care about this thing, so I'm gonna go rush in here and this is what we're gonna talk about. It really is paying attention to those things that are bothering, concerning, challenging students, and then taking them up in ways that allow the students to help solve their problems and understanding that the way they were able to solve the problem was using the skills, the knowledge, um, the information that being in this class or being in school provided for them. So an example would be, one of, one of the best examples of this uh, socio-political consciousness or critical consciousness that I saw happen in a high school classroom mm -hmm. where a youngster came in upset because he said that the school's hat rule was inequitably applied. You know, now I'm putting it in academic language, but he basically said it's no, they only pick on the black kids for the hat rule. Right. And the teacher's response was, is that how you feel individually or is that what's actually happening? And so they went back and forth with him saying, no, 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 they, they only they always pick on us. The teacher helped them design a survey divided the class into four groups, one for each class, freshmen through seniors, to sample, have you ever been stopped uh, for wearing a hat? What was the outcome? When they assembled that data, the youngster was right that there were other people, there were, were girls, there were people, white students who, Oh, they wore hats, but they got told, take your hat off. And that was it. Where Black students would talk about being um, detained, being right. threatened with suspension. And what happened is they wrote it up as a report and presented it to the administration. And to the administrator's credit, he took it to the teachers and said, this is not fair. If we're going to do this, if this is going to be a rule, it has to be applied fairly. Now, what I thought was really powerful you know, like I don't care about hats, okay? And I don't know that the teacher cared about hats, but a 15 year old did. A 15 year old said, you know, the, the, there's nothing I can do about this. I feel powerless, you know, I'm under surveillance. And so the ability to show the system how it is unfair is an example 
uh, of um, the kind of sociopolitical or critical consciousness, not merely carrying water for a teacher around some issue that teachers care about. Uh, I will tell you, I had a talk to do for Paul Gorski the mm -hmm. night that um, Derek Chauvin was sentenced. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that came from the audience was, well, what do we tell kids tomorrow uh, about this um, sentencing? And uh, my response was, first of all, you got to figure out whether the kids even care. Right. Uh, if I'm a kid in Columbus, Ohio, maybe what I really want to care about, because this, this happened on the same night, about that young lady that got shot who has some mental health challenges. That's right. Maybe. So it's always paying attention to the social and critical issues of the students, right. uh, not, not promoting our agendas in this. So, so, and so that's what makes it difficult because you can't know ahead of time what students are going to bring to you. And so one of the things you do, and then we'll, we'll uh, get to a couple of questions, but one of the things that, that you know, in that, um, that postscript, but also I think in that, that 1995 piece and other pieces is you give those examples and, um, and oftentimes it does, uh, you know, scale out or project outward toward uh, uh, some of the social movements of the time. But it's not it's not uh, bringing the social move. It's 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 the way that what young people and others are engaged in um, is part of those larger social movements, not the other way around. Right. It's kind of what Chris Emden talks about when he says the the Pentecostal pedagogy that you kind of get in a moment. You may be teaching in one direction, but then you know some of the 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 talk back brings mm -hmm. up an important issue that you have to uh, take up with students and engage with them. So it's not, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not your turning the students into your partisan mouthpiece. It's having them understand that they actually can do something about those things that uh, concern them. It, you know, I, I feel like you, you are in some way are answering this question that comes from um, someone you know, Timothy San Pedro from the audience. He, he asked, how do we help youth overcome a system not meant for them? I feel like you're, you know, you're, an, you're answering that question um, in a lot of ways. Um, we have another, another question coming in from um, uh, Kriya uh, Velasco and Kriya asks, uh, how do you imagine education 100 years from now? What is your dream and your passion and your purpose for that education? Well, I think a lot of the talks that I've been given since we've been in this COVID moment have been about, um, what I've called the uh, hard reset. That's right. The idea that um, this could be one of the best opportunities we will have. Absolutely to, agree. To do it right. Uh, I regularly quote Arundhati Roy mm -hmm. and her notion that the pandemic is a portal and that this is our opportunity to leave a lot of crazy stuff on the other side of this portal. The data banks and the dead skies and the, the, the uh, you know, the smoke, the, the dead rivers, the smoky skies, all of this stuff she says that we've accumulated on this side. We can go through the portal, as she says, with light luggage into a, a to imagine a new world and to fight for it. So, you know, that's the question that I have. What's our new world going to look like? Uh, one of my uh, favorite experiences uh, during COVID has been to visit a lot of classrooms remotely since everybody had to learn from home. And I remember uh, going to a high school class in Baltimore. And, you know, my first question is, you know, how are you guys coping with this remote hybrid virtual learning? And I was all prepared to hear all the, the moaning and bitching and moaning about. It. And this one kid tells me, he says, oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I said, really? I said, yeah. what do you like about it? He said, listen, when these people get on my nerves, I just click and turn them off. Right. <laughs> you know, so I said, well, what do they do? He said, oh, in a few minutes, they, they'll call you. And then I tell them I'm having internet connectivity problems. <laughs> now, I laughed just like you did. But okay. when I really thought about it, what uh -huh. the young man was telling me is that for the first time in my life, I'm in control of my learning. Cool. 
That's right. If I had clicked off metaphorically in the classroom, I'd have got kicked out because right. my clicking off would have been putting my hoodie up, putting my head down, saying I've had enough. That's right. And so if we learn nothing else from being in the midst of this is that the students are going to be able, they, they will tell us more about how they ought to be taught. We just have to be willing to listen and, and follow through with it. Yeah, and I'm thinking about, you know, that, that Jasmine Moore, who you met earlier, she's to, uh, working on thinking about educational consent, particularly with Black girls. And this, this uh, example is, the, you know, consent, as uh, um, Leanne Simpson has, the Anishinaabe uh, scholar Leanne Simpson has written about, is, is not part of nation state settler schooling, right? Uh, and so uh, this is really important and interesting uh, to think about um, in, in the possibilities of our our future. And so I'm going to pass it just in a moment off to Jasmine, who's going to give away some free copies of the book, um, which is very exciting. Um, but I also wanted to, to say, as you were, as you were uh, mentioning there and thinking about um, the pandemic as portal and, and where we might go, um, I was thinking about the ways that you cite uh, Patricia Hill Collins and Black feminist thought as so foundational um, to asking this different question and to what you were thinking about really at that time uh, in the writings, writing of that piece and, and during that postdoc. And I'm thinking about you know, the, the, the leadership and vision of, of native and indigenous people. And so I'm just thinking about the, the wells that we have drawn from and continue to need to draw from for, for this, uh, this, you know, this hard reset. And, uh, and it's certainly the case that you, know, you talked about Septima Clark and pushing us toward our dreams that you um, Gloria have pushed so many of us toward our dreams and our dreams of our, our, our communities, our families, our elders. And so we just continue to thank you for that. And Jasmine, you want to give away a few books? Sure thing. Uh, well, I want to also thank you so much for this conversation and this dialogue, Dr. Lassen Billings, and a huge shout out to everyone who is in attendance, who is continuing to add questions to the chat. I wish we had more time and could get to them, but we definitely hope that you will continue to think about these questions and take them up, hopefully, when you get a chance to engage with your own copy of Culturally Relevant Pedagogy asking a different question. And what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna raffle off three free copies of this amazing book. And so if your name is selected, Teachers College Press, the book's publisher will contact you via the email address you registered for this event with. So our first raffle winner is Andy Garbaz. Our second raffle winner, winner excuse me, is Antuma Wida Priandita. And our third raffle winner is Yvette Hayes. So once again, our winners are Andy Garbaz, Ansema Wida Priandita, and Yvette Hayes. So congratulations to our winners. Again, please keep an eye out for an email from Teachers College Press about how to receive your free copy of the book. Now, I know I'm a little jealous of our three winners. Uh, and for those of you who also did not win the raffle, it's okay, because we still have an opportunity for you to get a discounted copy of Culturally Relevant Pedagogy Asking a Different Question. So if you visit tcpress.com, you can use the discount code CRP Launch, and you will receive 15% off your copy of the book, plus free shipping for the entire month of November. You know, the holidays, some <laughs> holidays are coming. And if you would like to, you know, give someone this, might be on my wish list. Um, so please use that code. It has also been added to the chat or it will be shortly for you to use in order to get a discounted copy of the book. So thanks everyone. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn things back over to Django. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And again, look out for Jasmine Moore's beautiful work. Um, it's, it's happening, it's on the horizon. And so we're gonna close this out by, um, by opening up the chat in a moment. And what we're gonna do is I'd like everybody that's uh, out there with us, if you have some, uh, some love for Gloria Latson Billings' uh, beautiful work, um, things that it has allowed you to do, um, things you're thinking about in this moment, um, but really just uh, appreciation for uh, Dr. Gloria Latson Billings, uh, her extraordinary work with culturally relevant uh, pedagogy, with CRT and education, and, and, and her leadership and vision. So um, anything this work has meant to you, please, we're gonna open the chat up and you're uh, welcome to go ahead. We'll have a little waterfall, a little cascade uh, <laughs> appreciation and we can check it out, I think, Gloria, as it comes in. All right, the chat is open. Yes, there it goes. 
A legend, indeed. Oh, that's beautiful. The other thing that this is, it has made me remember, Gloria, is how much I miss you and how, uh, how I'm so looking forward to the next time we're, we'll be able to be in person together. I know. We, we had a great time at my retirement soiree where, where the food was overmarked. <laughs> <laughs> remember? It was indeed. That was a party. That was a really, really beautiful, beautiful event. Um, it was the retirement party into more work more beautiful work, but that, yes. was, that, was a, yes. that was a wonderful event. So thank you everybody. I'm seeing um, these and I know uh, Gloria is as well. Oh wow, yes. it's really thank gorgeous. You. Oh my. Oh my, it, hey, there's a guy from the Palm Springs was in there. I saw I, him. I saw that dude from Palm <laughs> Springs. He's up there in the Springs. Um, uh, this, is, this is really wonderful. So thank, <laughs> thank you everybody. Um, for these beautiful words. Uh, you know, we all anxiously await our copy of this book and re really we just continue to be thankful and, um, and, and await, you know, the next, the next work, um, the, the continued vision um, of Gloria Latson Billings. And uh, with that, I think we'll probably say good night to everybody. Look at this, it's 5.02. We've made our hour amazingly. Um, but uh, peace and blessings, everybody. We thank you for joining us and, uh, and for sharing these beautiful words in the chat, which is a really wonderful send off. Well, thank you so much, Django. Thank you for pushing me to do this because you know, it wasn't on my mind to do it, but uh, uh, I'm so glad that you really kind of turned the screws and said, come on, you can get this done. So I appreciate it. Thank you all. Um, I miss being able to be out there with, with folks. Um, but this has been fun. This has been a good, this has been a good substitute. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Gloria, and good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>